So we're really happy and, and proud to have uh, two friends now on, on stage. They, they actually know, know each other, so we, they might tell you a bit more about their history uh, together. But uh, so Jeremy Haymans is the founder and CEO of Purpose, a leading consultancy based in New York that work with organizations and help them build movements. He was also the founder of Avaz.org, and he's really one of the leading thinkers now on how to empower the crowd and how to uh, build movements with, uh, with citizens. And she founded Meo Rio, and uh, I, I think we could say, she's 25, and I think we can sh say she is the worst nightmare of the mayor of uh, Rio de Janeiro. So please welcome Alessandra Orofine on stage. Hello, thank you very much to be here. We're going to talk about politics now. So um, politics is an organization, grassroots movements, new power. So I leave uh, the word to Jeremy, who's going to present his framework now. Thank you very much, Diana. It's great to be here, uh, everybody. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run you through a little framework that, um, that I published with Henry Timms um, about a, a concept called new power. And uh, let me sort of let me talk let me talk you through this very briefly, and then I, I look forward to a discussion um, with my my longtime colleague Alessandra, uh, uh, and I'm very very excited to hear from you guys. So basically, you know, I'm an activist. That's what I do uh, for a living. And uh, as activists, you often get asked kind of fairly inane questions about the link between technology and activism. So a question I've heard frequently is. Uh, the Arab Spring, was that caused by Twitter? And often people revert to this very reductionist analysis where they say, well, everything that's happening in the world that's changing is actually explained by technology. But actually, I think the much more interesting lens to understand changes that are happening, the emergence of the collaborative economy, big shifts in politics, the increase in political protest and disruption, uh, even the emergence of the Islamic State, is actually around shifts in power and models that have emerged uh, that are bottom up, that are more distributed, that are based on some form of mass participation or peer coordination. So let me run through this very simple explanatory framework and, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll invite some discussion about it. So uh, it's a contrast between what you might call old power and what you might call new power. Old power is held like a currency. The more you have of it, right, uh, the more you hoard, the more powerful you are. New power, in contrast, um, is, is essentially a current. So it's most powerful <coughs> when it's flowing. It's not most powerful when you hoard it, rather it's when you channel it, like water or electricity when it surges. Old power is held by a few, it's inherently something that a few people capture. New power and new power models are made by many. Old power is basically based on download. It's based on asking people to buy stuff, asking people to vote for you. There's, uh, you know, the essential ask is based on download. Read this newspaper. New power models are obviously based on various forms of upload. Now these are very simple principles that you'll be very familiar with as practitioners in the collaborative economy. So uh, what you then think about and what we laid out in Harvard Business Review is that uh, you then think about models that deploy new power um, and what the kind of principle enabling behavior behind those models is. So, you know, old power models are based on consumption, right? Read the newspaper. It really, the ask is, is a download ask. And then as you move up the participation scale, you see different kinds of enabling behaviors. So, you, you know, Facebook is enabled by sharing, right? Basically, sharing content is the enabling behavior that supports Facebook. You know, something like Rap Genius is enabled by shaping, people's ability to adapt, to remix, to shift content. Uh, crowdfunding platforms, platforms like peer-to-peer -peer lending, like Lending Club, funding. Producing, uh, where basically people are producing or sharing their own real assets. Many of you guys are doing that. 
platforms like Etsy, platforms like Airbnb. And then at the top of the curve, you have uh, participatory behaviors uh, and models that actually enable co-ownership. Right? You could argue that Wikipedia has strong elements of co-ownership in its model. Certainly, cryptocurrency models, Bitcoin, um, are primarily based on co-ownership. So uh, very quickly, you know, these participatory behaviors are changing people. So if you're a young person, um, you know, when I grew up, we had five TV stations and, you know, your choice was to watch those stations. And today, someone uh, who's a teenager can command a huge media following, can produce their own assets, has far more agency. And that ability to have, you know, much more agency and to disintermediate the traditional middleman. So if in the 21st century you don't even need the bank anymore because you can disintermediate it and use a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform, you see the emergence of certain values. And so we contrast in the Harvard Business Review piece old power values and new power values. Let me draw your attention to a couple of the key contrasts. So there's certainly um, a belief at the level of governance in more opt-in, more informal, more self-organized approaches to governance. So, you know, we say uh, the new power crowd would not have invented the United Nations, right? New power is more flash mob and less general assembly. And you might not think that's necessarily a good thing because more formal 20th century forms of governance tend to guarantee and include people in more formal ways. There's certainly a strong bias toward collaboration as a norm, clearly you guys are living this, as opposed to traditional 20th century values. So you think about the engine of, say, the financial services sector, right? You think of Michael Douglas in, in Wall Street in the 80s. The, the value that was rewarded within the context of being a banker was being a, a highly effective hoarder, being competitive, uh, having exclusivity, having something over your rivals that, that they don't have. Whereas clearly the platforms that, um, that the people in this community here are building reward collaboration, right? You don't get to be a good Airbnb host if you lie about the kind of uh, bath products that you say will be in the bathroom. So, um, you know, these norms get strengthened. And if you think of, you know, human beings as having impulses in both directions, uh, these new models tend to produce better collaborators. You also have obviously a very strong bias toward radical transparency. So in the 20th century, gentlemen went into rooms and made gentlemen's agreements and people thought that was actually a good thing, right? Uh, and in the 21st century, like it or not, when Hillary Clinton's emails don't get revealed to the world, people get very upset. Um, there's also a distinction between professionalization and specialization, which were the great virtues of the 20th century, and the kind of maker culture, the belief in, uh, as my friend Scott Heifman, who's here today, says, the idea of do it ourselves as a kind of governing ideology. And you also see a lot more participation in these new power values, but that, that participation is much less enduring. So what we did in HBR and, and in the TED talk is basically then kind of connect this uh, on a matrix. So I've described some of those models enabled by those participatory behaviors. And we then describe uh, the values and thinking about where organizations fit. And let me draw your attention to a couple of these groups. So, you know, uh, Apple, right? Uh, people often mistake Apple because it's technology with being new power. But as, as many of you guys know, there's really nothing new power about Apple fundamentally, maybe except the App Store, right? It's based on the ideology of the perfectionist product designer in Cupertino who knows best and that product is dropped on us and the only ask Apple makes of us is buy, right? Um, and that's great and it's been a very successful model for them. They also don't really practice new power values. They tend to be pretty, pretty secretive and they don't collaborate particularly well organizationally. You might then contrast the Obama campaign, which was based very strongly on values of uh, uh, new power, right? You know, clearly crowdfunding elected Barack Obama helped him eclipse Hillary Clinton, uh, a self-organized distributed network of volunteers. But in office, Barack Obama's pretty old power, right? You know, in terms of the way he's governed, he hasn't fundamentally made governing more participatory. And so, you know, a question to ask you guys is where your organizations sit and where some organizations in the collaborative economy sit or those that we could debate are in the collaborative economy. So one example would be Uber. We, we identify Uber here as really a, a, a company with a new power model, right, based on a, a peer network, but fundamentally, so far, old power values. 
And this raises a whole bunch of interesting questions that I hope we'll explore in the discussion about how new power models continue to fundamentally serve their networks. So you take a Facebook or an Uber and you see most of the value in those networks being captured at the top, not being pushed down into the network Right? There's really no co-ownership that's meaningfully happening in a network like Facebook. They're using all of our creativity and, and, and capturing that. And, and it's certainly not often being pushed out into society. So a structural question for new power models, including many of you as you scale, is how fundamentally do these models um, what, when they're operating within old power superstructures like the capital markets, etc., fundamentally serve the interests of their networks and society more broadly, because I think we're seeing a real dissonance between models and values right now. So I'll stop there and yeah. uh, take it from Excellent question. There. I think we're, we're going we're gonna to come back to it later. Uh, but before, Alessandra, you have a great experience in, in grassroots movements in cities. Can you present your, what is Meo Rio, how it, how it works? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I think I'm going to go back to something that Jeremy said at the beginning, uh, that he, asked, uh, he gets asked a lot uh, whether the Arab Spring was started by Twitter or caused by Twitter. Uh, the question that I get asked a lot is whether technology is changing government and democracy fundamentally. And I think that 10 years ago, there was big hopes for that. Um, Clay Sharkey on TED or others just sort of spreading the word about how technology and collaborative platforms would fundamentally change the way we govern uh, democratic societies, at least. Um, and I think 10 years later, we can say that that hasn't really happened um, for many reasons. And I think one of the main reasons is that we actually put all of our faith in technology instead of looking at power and how power works um, and working together to organize the power we have uh, with each other and the power that, the power that we can have over other institutions or people uh, to actually fundamentally change uh, the way our societies are run. Um, another, I think, pitfall of looking at technology as the answer for a more democratic society or more democratic cities or nations um, is that we often fall victims of this idea that representative democracy was designed um, as a logistical, uh, logistical answer to a logistical challenge as if we needed to elect representatives because we cannot actually assemble everyone that needs to talk about an issue or make a political decision in the same room. And in that sense, because technology enables a collaboration um, across time and space, it would change the game uh, because that logistical answer wouldn't be necessary anymore. And I think the fundamental flaw and, and maybe the reason why we haven't really made that much progress uh, in radically democratizing our institutions um, is that representative democracy was not a logistical answer to a log logistical challenge. It was a system designed to keep people away from power um, and to essentially guarantee a peaceful transition of power amongst a handful of elites that hold all of the resources necessary um, to actually govern in the representative system. So um, going back to the work that I do in Rio, what we've been trying to do for the past uh, three and a half years um, is actually get people together and connected to each other, identifying common issues and interests so they can actually advocate for change in policy at the city level. And in, in a way, we're operating at this intersection between sort of digital movements that have emerged in the past decade that use technology really smartly to actually gain scale um, and, and lower the cost of activism um, and more traditional grassroots uh, organizing that relies on meaningful connections between people, um, person to person, eye to eye, um, and that can also be enabled and, and made easier by technology, but it fundamentally requires a shared space. Um, and I really believe in the city as the best space for that because it allows uh, for that human connection while being extremely important as we move into um, new challenges um, and as we try to build a world that is more just and more sustainable and actually reflects the needs and wants and dreams of citizens. Um, we're now in Rio, a community of 200,000 uh, people and we're expanding to other cities in Brazil, Latin America and soon outside of the region uh, through a collaborative network. So essentially 
uh, trying to find founders, people who want to create organizations similar to Milhiu in their own cities, and we're giving them the knowledge we have and the technology we have and, and supporting them the best we can and, and hoping that they'll do a great job. But I think that at, at the root of this, and, and this is a, really the point that I, I would love to make to you, um, is this idea that we will not be saved by a silver bullet, whether it's technology or something else. Like the, the work of building a world that actually reflects what we need is real work and it, require, it requires real organization. Um, and it requires that we actually speak um, old, old power values and models as well. We need to speak that language. We cannot be in our collaborative bubble thinking that just because we're sharing and producing in a new way, we are already changing the world because the rules of the game are not being defined by us right now. But we can change that. We have immense resources. We have a whole lot of power, uh, but we do need to organize better and mediate our own conflicts and get to at least a minimal agenda that allows us to work together uh, towards actually breaking those elite models that have kept us at bay um, and completely disenfranchised for so long. So I think I'll stop there and answer your question. Yeah, you are, you are both really aware of the critic of technological solutionism that has been formulated by our beloved troll Evgeny Morozov several times. So you, you very cleverly avoided. But nevertheless, all these movements maybe also are based on technology and old power models and elites try to develop their own application and techno technology and apps in order to uh, imitate what's happening in this grassroots moment. So um, I have actually two questions. The, f the first one is how to avoid um, the hijacking of this new power models by ancient elites. And on the other side, when they try to take power, uh, to exercise it, how to avoid institutionalization of this uh, grassroots movements that actually um, like are based on an energy of the crowd also? Well, I'll start there. I mean, there are a few different dynamics to tease out. So one is when, you know, governments, for example, try to stop grassroots online activity. And, you know, I don't think you can make a fake grassroots movement. So you, you don't see a lot of um, old power kind of coercive forces actually manufacturing a fake movement, right? What you instead see is attempts to really curtail and create fear. Right. I mean, so Avaz, and just to, to be clear, I was introduced as the founder of Avaz. I'm, I'm a co-founder and no longer involved in the organisation. But Avaz, you can't you can't manufacture Avaz, right? You can't just dream that up out of out of nowhere. Um, that said, the hijacking I think often happens by well-intentioned people within these new power models. So so you know if you're uh, you know if you're building one of your collaborative economy ventures, you get really big, you take a billion dollars in venture capital uh, or investment, suddenly you're subject to the vicissitudes of an old power superstructure with very different incentives. And I think that's the fundamental problem. And so we have to redesign the way we create and distribute value. So if more of these models had meaningful co-ownership, in other words, if an Uber was co-owned by the drivers, or indeed if a Facebook was meaningfully co-owned by the network participants, by us, these models would be much more progressive and much more redistributive. And I think that's the sort of challenge to address. Um, yeah, I think when it comes to co-opting by governments, which is what I uh, face the most, um, I think first transparency became this big buzzword and then everyone wanted to be more transparent. And then I think people started realizing that and governments would say they were transparent by carefully selecting just you know, what's convenient to release out to the public and get that information out and say, well, now we have open data. But really, it's just the data we want. It's not the data you want. Um, and, and we're giving you data on things that are not actually that meaningful, you know, traffic data, whatever it is. Like you can build a whole bunch of interesting apps on, to on top of traffic data, but really what people in my city want to know is not what traffic looks like, it's how do you select the bus companies that are actually running the entire mobility system for the city? Right? And that kind of information was never really part of the transparency movement as it was co-opted by, by governments. Um, I think after transparency, we saw participation become a big buzzword. Uh, because I think gradually people realize that, you know, transparency without uh, participation is not really that meaningful. I have all this information, but I have no input and no way of actually action, uh, 
taking action or and changing the world on the basis of that information. And now participation is also becoming co-opted. And I think the, the most common way of trying to co-opt the narrative of participation is by creating a really beautiful collaborative process that leads to no decision. Um, and that's exactly what, uh, and city governments are actually, I think, particularly bad at that, or good at that, depending on how you, how you see it. Um, we have a proliferation of city labs all around the world run by city governments that are, um, and some of them are actually doing really interesting work, some of them are not. And I think the ones that are not are essentially using participation as a marketing tool and creating these systems where people are supposedly heard and they can give input on all sorts of things, usually the not very important things, but there is no chief, there is no budget attached to those decisions, there is no real decision-making power being devolved to the citizens. Um, I'll give you one example from Rio because I think it speaks loads. Um, there was an app released by city government, at, it, that was like four years ago, it's been a while. It was an iPhone app and four years ago, uh, even today, but four years ago there was definitely not a lot of people owning iPhones. Then they released it for Android, but still, smartphones were so... Um, so uncommon in Rio four years ago. And you could report problems in the city. And the three kinds of problems you could report on were potholes, broken lamps, fallen trees. And that's in the city where half of the population doesn't have basic sanitation. So that's co-opting right there. And, and I think that's why these outside-in models like Mirio are so important. So Mirio being proudly independent of government, not having a stake in those things, you know, these models are much less easily captured and it allows them to really serve people deep into the community. And, and I think, you know, it's a great example of, 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 of why you can't always work within existing structures, why you have to sometimes work around them. Yeah. Um, like... In Europe, we have like new movements, political movements like Podemos, Syriza, that have been fighting to uh, trying to play with new rule game, new games rule. And the question is, one, the access to uh, to power that they, they become actually the ruling party. They start to exercise it. They tend to actually accept the rules of the ancient game. Isn't it a major risk for all the grassroots movements to uh, play as before because they don't have a choice? Well, I, I do think that in order to get anything worthwhile done in the world, you, you're going to need to to compromise, right? So there are there's inherently, as Ali alluded to, a need to sometimes uh, use a blended power approach to speak the language of old power, to understand how to use old power while developing new power. To me, the key thing to track is, are you shifting the superstructure itself? If all you're doing is building a wonderful new political party within a broken political system, then eventually that political party will itself unravel, right? Um, whereas if you have a reform agenda that includes changing government itself, right, building new institutions that are more responsive. And so I think that's in, in part the challenge with the president, President Obama in America, where he didn't really attack campaign finance, he didn't really attack the gerrymandering, the structural features of the system, despite obviously opposing those things rhetorically, which had he invested maybe more of his political capital on those structural questions, then maybe he would have left a longer term legacy because many of his progressive reforms will be wiped away the next time you know a, a kind of crazy Republican is elected. Yeah, a couple of comments on that. I think first, there are many ways to change the world and I, I, I I think that it's perfectly valid to try to change the world by playing by the rules and trying to change things from within. It's not the option that I have made so far, uh, but I, I think it's a valid option. And, and I think we need more of those. We need just more people trying to change the world altogether um, and, and doing that through different avenues, right? But I think that the fact that these political parties do tend to then um, become less interesting as they get access to power, just as Barack Obama became less interesting once he was president, is actually our fault. Because like, we expect that we're going to get involved in campaigning, that we're going to get these elected officers into uh, elected office, um, and once they're there, they're going to be some sort of like messiah that will come and save us from ourselves. And that is completely ridiculous. That just doesn't happen. And if we elect someone, we then need to make them do what we want. Because that's how you build political space for them to negotiate internal tensions 
and internal power struggles. You cannot expect a president of the United States to change everything single-handedly, but you can make him do it. And if you make him do it, he might be very happy that you're making him do it. Because he then, you know, when he negotiates internally, he can say, this is not me. This is the 30 million people asking me to do this. And that gives him a lot more power as he tries to change the system. Now, I'm not sure if that would be the case with Barack Obama, uh, but I certainly think that this idea that you're just going to elect someone, put them in a, a specific place in government, and then expect them to come up with the solutions is not just wrong, it's mediocre. It's stopping us short. It's just... <laughs> well put. That's political solutionism, actually. <laughs> a tendency to believe in a powerful leader that will solve everything. Um, I will have time for a last question. You, you, ask, you asked it from the beginning. Um, we have a lot of movements, as associations, that are trying to uh, apply these new models and use technology to uh, actually work out for their own interest. How to do, what are the means to, uh, in, to give them incentives to contribute to the common good? What, what, what is this and what is the common good actually for you in your, in your eyes? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit of a panetic question, of course. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think this is a very profound question, and, and it's actually my biggest worry with the, the way that many of these new power models are developing, which is I don't think uh, the people who are being incentivized to make a lot of money, right, because this has become very lucrative, particularly in the private sector, um, and, and even in the nonprofit sector, the, the sort of cult of the social entrepreneur doesn't always create the right incentives. And so this is, you know, I think fundamentally, building new models uh, that actually create different incentives is the only way to do it. So I would encourage you guys, as you're building your collaborative economy businesses, why capture all of the value for yourselves, right? Why not build a model that actually gives your network participants, whether they're drivers or uh, you know, any other kind of uh, user, meaningful share, right? It's more complicated, right? It means a little bit less for you, but it could be fundamentally transformational and it could create a beacon for other companies. And so um, I think that's a key direction um, for, you know, for, for these guys. The other thing is we frankly need Silicon Valley and the Silicon Valleys of the world to get a bit more structural, right? So they don't really have a point of view um, on uh, justice on inequality and you know I think we can often be in bubbles where we think that we're going to innovate or collaborate our way to solve problems that are basically about power right and are basically about injustice so I think if everybody kind of read a um, you know <laughs> read, read, read some more on, uh, on on justice or maybe read a little bit of Saul Alinsky and read a little uh, a little less uh, um, <laughs> a little less uh, Eric Knees or whatever, then uh, I think we might be, we, we might have a more interesting society that, that actually honors the potential of these models. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, we need to get serious about justice, people. This is what we're here to do. And I think that um, as collaborative economy uh, uh, activists and promoters, we tend to undermine the role of regulation in creating incentives. So oftentimes, because it's so hard to deal with bureaucracies, I come from a very bureaucratic country, it's so hard to get anything done. We see the government or the sort of any regulatory measures as something that is just keeping us from exploring our creativity and our ability to innovate. But regulation, when it's, right, when it's done well, can be a powerful tool for providing the right incentives to the right businesses. The thing is, the world was not regulated to serve what we think uh, should be served. Right? So we need to get serious about justice. We need to start reading some Sololinsky um, and others. But we, and we absolutely do need also uh, to look at the frameworks that govern how we do business, how we collaborate with each other, how we create and share value, and get serious about organizing to change those. Not just say, I don't want any regulation, because that usually means that the powerless will become more and more powerless. Um, and regulation is there to protect us from these asymmetries in power and information. But we do need to actually get into the dirty business of changing regulation to provide better incentives to ourselves and other institutions. Oh. One, one last, a little bit provocative question. Do you have guys' political agenda together? Politi do you have a political agenda? Uh, together? No, no, oh, no. Why not? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> we, 
We do. We do. do. You yeah. first, Tally. Don't uh, tell all our secrets. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, political agenda. Um, sure, I have a very extensive political agenda. Every Thank shitty. you. Um, yeah, I, I'm. Well, and that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm trying to get elected into office or anything. But I think, yeah, I do have a political agenda. I think we need to address inequality as one of the most pressing, most terrible issues in the 21st century. Not just absolute poverty, but the fact that we're creating value collectively and that value is being, more often than not, only captured by a, by a handful of people. We have a widening gap between the rich and poor all over the world, and that is a serious thing that we need to think about because the collaborative economy would not take off if only a handful of people are making money out of it. And nothing else will really change in this role unless that continues to be uh, the case. And aside from inequality, I think we just need to actually look at sustainability as something that is fundamentally challenging your life in this world, and we cannot really keep on living this way. We cannot be fearful of falling and not having a safety net. That is terrible for innovation, that is terrible for creating new businesses, and that just means that the only people that are actually able to be entrepreneurs are the ones who have families or some sort of trust fund or someone there to catch them if they fall. So if we're serious about creativity and collaboration and innovation, we need to be serious about inequality. And the same thing with sustainability. There's really no point in even having these conversations if the world is a doomed place for generations to come. So I think that's, in a few words, my political agenda. <laughs> and to leave you with, with two sentences, don't be afraid. I mean, the idea that, oh, you've got to be politically neutral, I think is, is misleading because no. political neutrality often means neglecting the biggest problems the world faces, like climate change, where we need people to say, no, 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 there's no neutrality on that issue. There's only action. So yes. when you're building your businesses, build them and organizations, build them in a way that has a clear point of view in the world. Right? That's what purpose does. We don't shy away from the fact that we take strong positions on every issue and we ask the question on every issue, uh, are we on the right side of that issue? And so I think we need more businesses with a point of view on the world rather than ones that see themselves as kind of blank, ideologically neutral platforms because often that's actually a way of reinforcing, not challenging existing structures. Thank you so much. Don't be afraid. Thank you.